We live in a peculiar universe. No matter which direction you look, it appears broadly the same. The distribution of stars, their sizes and properties, the planets orbiting them, all eerily consistent. Astrophysicists have a term for this, isotropy. This sameness is bafflingly uniform across almost all properties except one. Earth, alone in the universe, is the only place we've found life. That either means that Earth hangs alone in the cosmic void as the sole bearer of life, or, as new research from Cornell University suggests, maybe in our search for extraterrestrial life, we've been overlooking something this whole time, a form of life most of us wouldn't recognize. To delve deeper, I reached out to the team behind this work, Professor Lisa Kaltenegger, Professor of Astronomy at Cornell University and the founding director of the Carl Sagan Institute, and Cornell astrobiologist Ligia Cuejo. Lisa is one of the pioneers and most respected scientists in the hunt for finding alien life in our universe, so I'm going to treat this topic as a bit of a deeper dive than usual. Let's start with the basics. How do we find alien life right now? If you look for life in the cosmos, how do you find it? How can you even start to think about whether it should be the same as it is here? Because we, of course, have the Earth, the sample of one, could be very different. So what can we look for? In our search for extraterrestrial life, the first thing we need to do is understand how to find a potential life-containing planet. It's called the transit technique. And here we look at the star, stars become bright. But then, if it dims ever so slightly once in a while, you know that something moves between you and your view of this big hot stellar surface. And this is how you can catch planets going around other stars. And by how much dimmer the star gets, that tells you how big the planet is compared to the size of the star. So now you have discovered the silhouette or the shadow of another world around another star. But to actually detect signs of life, either we need to peer down through to the planetary surface, or we need to detect the right atmosphere or conditions for life on that planet. At the edge of technical possibility for the first time ever, we can collect enough light from small planets, and here I mean planets as small as the Earth, at the right distance, not too hot and not too cold, around other stars, so not the Sun, but another star, to figure out what's in the air of those worlds, and if some of the signs are signatures for life in the cosmos. The technique that Lisa is referring to here is called transit spectroscopy. When we train our telescopes on an exoplanet star, we can break the light from that star into its component colors using a prism, giving us a spectral distribution of how much light of each color the star is emitting. What we then wait for is the exoplanet to pass in front of the star. Some of the starlight will be blocked by the planet, which is what told us there was a planet there in the first place, but some of it will pass between the planet's surface and the thin layer of atmosphere around the planet. As the starlight passes through this layer, certain colours of light may be absorbed by certain species of gas in the atmosphere, gases like CO2 or oxygen or methane, which will absorb only certain wavelengths of light that resonate with their molecular bonds. These wavelengths are removed from the starlight for just the short duration of the planet passing in front of the star, giving us a fingerprint of what gases must exist on that planet. But this technique pointing us straight to life isn't quite as simple as it might seem. Because there's a lot of fringe environments, right? When you say like, oh, what about if you see, I don't know, oxygen on a mini Neptune, right? On, an, on a gas planet. Well, that's really not a sign of life because under the condition of a mini Neptunes, you could get oxygen or different gases differently. What about if you have a super hot Earth, then you could actually split water into oxygen and hydrogen and again, get oxygen as a false positive signature for life. So we have to be extremely conservative to not get fooled. 
And the best signature pair we have right now is the combination of oxygen with a reducing gas like methane in the air of a planet that is warm and is a rock. This complexity in finding what the right signs of life might actually look like is why Lisa and her team are turning to future techniques to help give them confidence. Our next generation of telescopes will be able to employ something called reflectance spectroscopy by looking at the light reflected off of these exoplanets and breaking it into its respective colors we may hope to find signs of life from the presence of vegetation and its respective colors on these planets for that to come true we need to also do some homework so here on earth we need to make reference of how life actually looks like at the surface now you might be expecting me here to say the focus will be on green light, because our planet is dominated by green plant life. But plants only look green to us because their chlorophyll in their leaves that they use for photosynthesis absorbs blue and red light and doesn't absorb green light very well at all. So what the human eye sees is a green color of around 550 nanometers. But the problem with us is that human eyes are trained on the visible light spectrum. If we actually look at plants under the full spectra, we see that plants aren't green at all. They are infrared. So if you are looking for life that may look like planet Earth's life, you don't look for green, you look for what they refer to as a red edge, a specific spectral feature characterized by a sudden peak around the far infrared, about 700 nanometers. This signature of life is what scientific survey teams have been hoping to look for for a very long time. However, there is a big problem with a very Earth-centric approach. Life on other planets might not look like what we are used to. Maybe alien life uses molecules or gases that life on Earth simply doesn't or can't use. Or rather than chlorophyll in the leaves of plants, maybe they use something else so this red edge doesn't actually appear. This is where Lisa and Leisure are taking a really interesting approach to making sure extraterrestrial life doesn't pass through our telescope objectives undetected. And they have strong evidence that we should be looking for life on other planets that doesn't look at all like what we are used to. You can think about green landscapes, which is what you're seeing now, maybe from your window. But that's just a very narrow, limiting vision of Earth that we are implementing in our models, if we just think of that. Because that's Earth right now and in uh, on the place we like to live. It's not even the only Earth we have right now. Our bias that life on other planets might look like life on Earth isn't just Earth biased, it's also human friendly environments on Earth biased, where the life around us has evolved to deal with the same problems that we have, in arguably the most supportive to complex life environment we have ever found in the universe. Life that is dealing with the equivalent of biological first world problems. When you go outside, you see all these green plants around you. And so, of course, it's logical to think, if I want to look at another world, I'll look for something green. Because there might be some plants out there, uh, something that I know how to look for. But even on the Earth, we have a large variety of biota. And some use a different color to actually produce energy. The possibilities of what you can find are illimited. You can try to find microbe life, you can try to find an algae planet, you can try to find civilizations, you can try to find any type of planet you think. Just try to imagine other planets. With the biodiversity you have on Earth, you can create, start to imagine other types of life that are not based on water or not based on carbon. Chlorophyll that is found in most plants and is the basis for green life around us is a biological marvel but it's also quite complex to evolve and only works in quite friendly and stable environments. If you were to expose chlorophyll to too much UV radiation, you break it, which means that a planet that chlorophyll exists on needs to be really good at blocking out UV. If chlorophyll is exposed to low light levels, it stops running efficiently. So you need a nice bright yellow sun nearby. And actually, most stars aren't like ours. We have 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone. But when you look at those, most of those are not yellow suns. Most of the stars are actually small red suns. And so any kind of life that developed there would actually get red sunlight. 
Red dwarfs are less than 70% the size of our sun and have significantly cooler surface temperatures, meaning that rather than being nice and bright and yellow, they are cooler and redder. This is what our sun's emission spectra looks like. It peaks in the UV and far blue end of the visible spectrum, which is why life on Earth largely uses visible light for photosynthesis and the processes of life. Due to their cooler temperatures, M-type stars emit most of their light in the red and infrared parts of the spectrum. A lot of people worry about this, uh, limiting life. But even on the Earth, we have life that can strive under red light. And mostly because they're in mats, and so the further down you go, if your colony in the mat further down, you don't get all the yellow light because that's been used up. So you get more red light, and so they have evolved to use it. But when you turn this around and say, we know that there are so many red stars out there, why are we looking for green plants? So both a different driver of life is needed and we should be looking for something different to what we see on Earth. But what would that actually look like? We have different kinds of life even on our own world that live under very different conditions. Some in niche environments, so things like hot sulfur springs or really dry areas, really hot, really cold. So Lisa and her team set out to collect life from these different extreme environments to see how they survive. And again and again, they found life predominantly bacterial in nature that has adapted and thrived and does not use chlorophyll-like systems that we know in plants nowadays, but photosynthetic structures much better suited to their environments and capable of absorbing light in the infrared, a set of pigments called bacteria chlorophylls. So it's a type of chlorophyll, So it, because this is a type of photosynthesis, but it's a type of photosynthesis that occurs in the dark. Actually, for us to grow them in the lab, we usually use a, a close a drawer with an IR source of radiation, and we close it and they just grow. These bacteria chlorophylls are capable of harnessing infrared light, what we commonly think of as heat, to convert it into energy. For many M-type stars around our galaxy, this type of mechanism may be perfectly suited to fuel life, the way chlorophyll is perfectly suited on Earth. But both on Earth and potentially also on these alien planets, bacterial chlorophylls don't leave their bacterial hosts green, but commonly purple, brown, red, yellow, or orange. So potentially, all this time spent looking for green life and its signatures on other planets, life may in fact most commonly not be green, but be purple. We went to the field tons of times. We went to marshes, to rivers, uh, and I was already on the lookout for them. I was already, everything that was purple and pink, I was sampling it. If you have purple and pink things, can you please give them to me <laughs> so I can bring them back to Cornell and I can measure them all. Cataloguing various species from around the world, the team measured the reflectance of purple bacteria in their studies and modeled what different types of planet would look like if they were dominated by these organisms. Importantly for Lesia, the model wasn't just built around a single bacterial species at a time, but communities of bacteria. I didn't do pure cultures only. I did communities. And this is because that's the most truthful way to try to model a planet. Life is never alone. You never see an example where life is in a pure culture. If you put the pure culture in a petri dish, eventually it's going to die. It needs a cycle. It needs company. It needs to give feedback to something, inputs, outputs. It needs to try to compete. It needs to try to be friends. Uh, we need to be in an ecosystem. That's one of the main requirements for life. The models that came out of this study are an important tool to arm astronomers with so that future planet studies can detect more of a complete spectrum of possibilities for life. There are different kinds of bacteria and different kinds of organisms, different kinds of algae. Just think about a red algae bloom that could cover a whole planet. How would that look like? Actually, this idea of a planet dominated by purple life isn't so wild. In fact, some scientists have hypothesized that at one point, life on Earth was purple.
The Purple Earth Hypothesis proposes that the very first photosynthetic organisms on Earth were a type of archaea called Halobacteria, which evolved over 2.5 billion years ago. They used a compound called retinol, a much simpler pigment to evolve than even bacteria chlorophyll, to harness the green, abundant and energetic wavelengths of light on Earth. At this time on Earth, it was extremely hot, the oceans were much saltier, the atmosphere had almost no oxygen in it, meaning that there was very little ozone layer, so the surface of Earth was bombarded by UV radiation. Generally, Earth was a pretty inhospitable place to be, but these halobacteria were well adapted to the harsh conditions of early Earth. The question obviously is, so what changed? How did Earth end up green rather than purple? Although harder to evolve and more prone to damage, chlorophyll-containing organisms like cyanobacteria were able to slowly evolve in the early Earth environment. Chlorophyll, we said before, uses a higher energy part of the light spectrum, which gives these organisms an unfair advantage. But what really swung the tide in their favour was a byproduct of photosynthesis using chlorophyll is oxygen. This oxygen started to enter the atmosphere creating an ozone layer, reducing the UV radiation bombarding Earth's surface and making it even easier for chlorophyll-based life to take hold. The result was the Great Oxygenation Event, which occurred around 2.4 billion years ago. This event dramatically increased atmospheric oxygen levels, leading to the decline of anaerobic retinal-based organisms. The rise of oxygen in the atmosphere then paved the way for evolution of more complex aerobic life forms that depend on oxygen for respiration. And over millions of years, green plants evolved from our ancestral photosynthetic bacteria, further transforming Earth's surface and atmosphere until we reach today, where green plants dominate the planet, their chlorophyll-based photosynthesis driving Earth's oxygen and carbon cycles, and in so doing, supporting a diverse range of life forms. Putting all these pieces together, it's interesting that we both require a very specific type of sun to achieve green life. In fact, early on, we were probably much more like most of the cosmos, in that life on this planet was purple. So, our answer seems to be, Go out and don't look for green, but look for purple. Is the answer as easy as that? Unfortunately, not. To find out, we're going to need better telescopes. So right now we don't have a telescope that can observe the surface of terrestrial planets. It doesn't exist. It's being conceptualized. It's called the Habitable World Observatory. So my work, what is going to help is shape these concepts and shape these telescopes. Um, if I give a lot of data now, modelers can start using this data and simulate these planets with these surfaces that I'm, that I'm giving them. It might be that life will be found by an archival scientist, someone that 20 years later are going to look at the archives and then identify it because the fundamental science then catched up. Because we don't want to miss signs of life just because they're not a carbon copy of modern Earth. And so often it's easy to get stuck in this idea, oh, there should be green plants, there should be green trees, there should be you and me we're searching for. Then no, we're searching for life, for the whole range of life that we know here on the earth existed and exists now. And then we keep our eyes open for interesting weird signals that we cannot explain yet. But those will have to be able to decipher between Ooh, that's geology alone, doesn't need any life. And ooh, here I have no other explanation in life. And the more different the planet gets from ours, the harder that is to do. But we're working on it. I really liked digging into this topic. I never really stopped to think before about the piece of evolutionary biology where you have to worry about the size, color, and distance to your local star in terms of thinking about what sort of life may actually evolve on your planet. Maybe on planets that are orbiting M-type stars, you get stuck at purple bacteria-like life and you never evolve anything more interesting on these dark, dim, swampy planets. Maybe on planets with stars even brighter and bluer than our own, either life never evolves because UV essentially cooks it, or if it does, well, 
Maybe that explains why in all of our UFO imagery, it has aliens emerging from very bright interiors of spaceships. Maybe to them, we are the dark, dim swamp life. Who knows? Thank you anyway to Lisa and Leisure. I'm eternally grateful that I do something that means that I can reach out and talk to fantastically interesting people such as yourselves. Lisa, in fact, has just released a book called Alien Earth. She was kind enough to send me a copy. I'm going to read it this weekend and I will leave a link in the description if you'd like to pick up a copy. Thank you, as always, for watching. I will see you guys next week. Goodbye.